Good morning, everybody. Um, just wanted to highlight a few things before we have uh, Sarah, our pastor of children and family ministries, coming uh, today to bring the message as we finish up our April chapter called Easter with Jesus. Um, first of all, just want to uh, celebrate with you our our young people. We had about 23 young people on Friday and Saturday take part with our 30-hour famine. Uh, and uh, they raised about $2,700. So I think we ought to congratulate those young people. And uh, I, I, I try to be a leader of the model, so I also went into the 30-hour famine, and actually I feel more of a buzz right now than I did yesterday. So if I look a little woozy up here, I'm still trying to get food back in my body, but it was a great experience with those young people. Um, now, again, it's hard to believe. I just feel like so much has happened in the last week. Like, last weekend was Easter weekend, and Kevin already celebrated the generosity. I just want to highlight a few other things that took place last weekend. Uh, we had, um, uh, first of all, our Good Friday service, and we had a lot of great highlights. We had a, a, almost a 50-voice men's choir. We almost got there. So you men who didn't sing, you know who you are. We're going to get you next year. But we almost had 50 men. It was really exciting. Uh, we also had actually uh, an orchestral ensemble as well, uh, led by uh, Amy Dawson. And that was a great new experience for us. And, and of course, Micah, our associate pastor of youth and young adults, uh, preached. Um, we also had, um, it was another initiative, we, we had care packages made up for agencies around and we had 47 care packages made, and they were delivered to the Naomi and Ruth Women's Ministry. They were also delivered to Harvest House and to the Peter McKee Community Food Center. So there were a lot of wonderful things happening on Friday. We had our three services on Easter Sunday. We nearly had 800 people in total attendance through our Easter weekend. Uh, so we, we had a footprint of ministry and impact. And uh, I, I hope, again, we just really see the joy of our resurrection faith in Christ. Well, with that said, um, again, I just want to, I hope you encourage Sarah here. Uh, Sarah is studying for her Master's of Divinity right now at Acadia uh, Divinity College down in Nova Scotia. She works for, so she studies. She's a full-time mom with three teenage boys. She um, also works for us half-time, whatever that means. And, uh, and she has been a force in our presence here for the last couple of years within our children's and family ministries. So can you give Sarah a big hand as she comes to bring God's word? Thank you. We have just come through an exciting time in our church calendar. We've gone over the story of Jesus who lived here on earth, who came, who died, and was resurrected, and now is the rest of the story. We're going to read from Matthew 28, verses 16 to 20. It's probably in your outline, or you can look it up. The 11 disciples left for Galilee, going to the mountain where Jesus had told them to go. When they saw him, they worshipped him, but some of them doubted. Jesus came and told his disciples, I have been given all authority in heaven and on earth. Therefore, go and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Teach these new disciples to obey all the commands I have given you. And be sure of this, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. So what were the disciples thinking? Here they've gone through this big roller coaster. Palm Sunday when Jesus came in and was celebrated as the, a king, everything was, everyone was excited. There was news buzzing around. Within a week, he was on trial and murdered on the cross. The disciples, all their hopes were in the balance. They didn't know what to believe now. And then just a few days later, he's alive again. And they're still not quite sure what's going on. As we see in verse 17, some of them still doubted. They weren't quite sure what they were seeing. And even now, they still didn't fully understand what the mission was. Jesus was back. He was alive. In Acts 1.8, we read another version of this story where Luke talks about them asking, is now the time you're coming and you're going to redeem Israel? Now Jesus is going to restore Israel's self-rule. He's going to be the king that they always hoped he would be. 
And Jesus said, that's going to happen, but not yet. Only God the Father knows when that will happen. But he said, right now, I have a mission for you. And this mission is to make disciples. That was his main point. These are just his last words just before he's going up to heaven. And he says, make disciples. Jesus had just spent the last three years with his disciples and with those who were following them. He was building relationship with them. He was teaching them. He was training them. He was getting them ready. He told them that he has been given all authority in heaven and on earth. If we look back earlier in Matthew, when Jesus first started his ministry and went into the wilderness and was tempted, one of the temptations that Satan gave him was showing him all the kingdoms of the earth, saying, I'll give all of these to you if you will worship me. And Jesus resisted the temptation. He went through with the mission God gave him, and now he has all authority in heaven and on earth. He says, go and make disciples of all the nations. Again, when we look back earlier, the disciples had been sent out two by two, but Jesus initially said, just go to the Jews, go to those in our nation. Now he's saying, those borders are wide open. Now go into all the nations. This is a universal mission. This was also a fulfillment of the prophecy back in Daniel that said about Jesus, he was given authority, glory, and sovereign power. All nations and peoples of every language worshiped him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion that will not pass away, and his kingdom is one that will never be destroyed. So God, Jesus here is commissioning them to go, and and Matthew who is writing the gospel is saying they're there, they're standing on the mountain, they're being commissioned, but all who follow, all disciples of Jesus following are also being commissioned. And I think of Paul's writing in Romans 10 when he says, how then can they call on the one they have not believed in? How can they believe in the one whom they have not heard? How can they hear without someone preaching to them? And how can anyone preach unless they are sent? As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of those who bring good news. So Jesus here is sending us. He's sending all of his disciples, all those who follow him, to go out and spread the good news, to tell others about this wonderful story that we've been just uh, remembering during the Easter season. And as we look in the book of Acts, which shows the, the beginning of this, we see how it started, and it started in the local places of Jerusalem, but then it started to go out, and the end of it isn't the end, it's just the beginning of what's happening beyond, and that's our story that we are continuing. So what does this look like for us here in Atlantic Canada? We're Canadians. Canada used to be considered a Christian nation, where most of the population attended a church of some sort, but now we are in a postmodern, post-Christian age with rising secularism. As Pastor Dave mentioned, I've been taking some courses for my MDiv, and the one that I took this semester was actually evangelism and mission. So I was kind of excited doing this uh, message because I've been learning about it, I've been thinking about it, I've been wrestling with it. And I wanted to show you just a few slides from my course. I asked asked, uh, Dr. McMullen if I could use some of them. He said that was fine. And my background, my undergrad, is sociology. So I find statistics and those kind of things really interesting. If it's not your cup of tea, it's not going to be for very long. We'll just do a few of them. So don't worry. But I thought it's good to get a picture because sometimes we get stuck in our own bubble. We just kind of think of where we are, our own church, our own um, community, and we don't see that bigger picture. So I wanted to get a little taste of that. So our first slide is going to show us some statistics from Statistics Canada. It's within the last 10 years, so some of the numbers have probably changed a bit even since then. But this tells us about... Uh, people who attend church services in Canada. So 42% have never attended church. 30% 
go yearly. So those are probably our Christmas, maybe Easter, but they come once a year. Then we have monthly is 9% and weekly is 19. But we can see here 72% either don't come at all or maybe once a year. Our next one slide shows about those on surveys and how they identify themselves by religion in Canada. And again, this is within the last uh, 10 or so years. And so we can see way back from the late 1800s, the Roman Catholic Church has stayed fairly consistent, mainline Protestant, which would be um, like the United and the Anglican, some of the more mainline Protestant. They've seen a big uh, downward turn in the last uh, 50, 60 years. Conservative Protestants, which our Baptist Convention would be a part of, we've come up a little bit, and most of our increase has actually been from the mainline Protestants who have come uh, into our group. There's the other world face, and then at the very bottom is no religion. We call them the religious nuns, and this is kind of a newer phenomenon. It wasn't actually even on any surveys until the 1980s, so it's fairly new, but this is the one that we're seeing rising more and more. People who, want, who do just not identify with a religion at all. Our last, uh, no, our third one is uh, from, there's Dr. McMullen, and I thought this was interesting because this is in our, our area here, so Atlantic Baptist churches by decade since the 1950s, and the average number of new, new believers based on baptism. So we can see in the 1950s, we had well over 2,000 baptisms a year, and it's been going down till we see in the last decade, there's been maybe one or two per church in our convention. So baptisms is showing, that's showing how many people are becoming Christians, how many people are coming to faith in our convention, and that's really gone down. That's a, that's a concerning number. Our final one is a little more positive. This is just talking about conservative Protestants. Again, we're part of this group. And they comprise a small percentage, only about 12% as of 2012. But we are a vibrant player with human and financial resources matched by few other groups, large or small. More than six in 10 are monthly plus attenders, double the national level of participation. So even though we're small, we can still have a big impact. We can be a light in our community. And this uh, idea of secularization of people moving away from church, from identifying with religion, is happening across all age groups. None of us here can say, well, my, my, my demographic or the people in my age group are doing pretty good. Because I think they... Um, in the 40s to 60 year olds, that's one of the largest groups that is seeing people who are not coming to church, who are uh, moving away from their faith. So we might feel like the disciples did up on that mountain. As God, Jesus was saying, go into all nations, and they're looking across their borders thinking, how on earth do we go over there? How, how do we do this? And we might feel, how do we do this? How do we do this here? But do we sit back and say it's impossible? Do we say, I'm not going to do it? Can we truly call ourselves followers of Jesus if we don't? Jesus said that we, he said to make disciples. But what does it mean to be disciples who make disciples? So our next slide says this, a disciple keeps what Jesus says. Jesus said, teach them to keep or obey God's commands. It's not just knowing, it's doing. This is the process of discipleship. Again, Jesus spent five years with his disciples, teaching them, spending time with them, building relationships with them. They were living in community together. It wasn't them all by themselves. They were together, learning together. In John 5, 14, 15, Jesus said, if you love me, keep, obey my commandments. So love and obedience go together. 
thinking about this year as we go through the red letter road. Each week we've been learning and hearing the words of Jesus. What, what are they? What do they mean? How can we be living them out? And how can we go and teach someone else to keep the commandments of Jesus if we're not practicing ourselves? What kind of credibility can we have uh, in our community and to others if we're not living it out? A disciple, our second point, is also one who declares through baptism a new life in Christ. Jesus said to baptize them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit so that there's an understanding of who God is. There's a teaching about who God is. It's not just praying a prayer. This is new life. This is about someone experiencing new life in Christ. 2 Corinthians 5.17 says this, this means that anyone who belongs in Christ has become a new person. The old life is gone, a new life has begun. Baptism is a public declaration of what someone has decided to do, that they've decided to follow Jesus, that they are a disciple of Jesus. And we have our belong sessions uh, several times every year where we talk about baptism, we talk about some of these different things. And as I do that with the children, the elementary school children, I really tried to talk about how baptism is showing on the outside what God has done on the inside. And Romans 6, uh, 3 and 4 talks about this. It says, Or have you forgotten that when we were joined with Christ in baptism, we joined him in his death? For we died and were buried with Christ by baptism. And just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glorious power of the Father, Now we also may live new lives. So when we're baptized, we're declaring to everyone that we are following Jesus, what Jesus has done in our life. A disciple, thirdly, is also someone who doesn't wait for the world to come to them. Jesus said, go into all the world. We need to go somewhere. Now, a lot of times we think, well, this means I have to go overseas or I have to go to a different culture. And when I was a child, that was actually one of the things I wanted to do. I wanted to be a missionary. I thought it would be exciting, go overseas, tell people about Jesus. And I did some summer missions locally, but God never opened that door for me to go overseas for missions. And as I processed that, I began to realize that I can be a missionary here. I can be a missionary in my neighborhood, at my school, uh, wherever I go, I can do this. It's about living missionally in our lives. It means going across the street to our neighbor, going across the hall at work to a coworker, going across the hall at school to a fellow classmate, maybe going to family members who don't believe. It's not staying cloistered in our church groups or our small groups or with those who believe the same. We want to be together. We want to be together to encourage each other, to teach each other, to pray for each other, but then we need to go. This needs to happen in the context of authentic relationships. That is one of the keys of our postmodern culture is people want to see something real. They're not going to believe it just because it's said. They're not going to believe it because it's in the Bible. They need to see it in your life. This is being intentional in our relationships. So we're thinking about, God, who have you put in my life that I can be a friend to? Who in my life, you know, have, have you placed me uniquely to have an influence? It's also being ready for the spontaneous God moments that God has planned ahead of time and we just find ourselves in. It's getting to know other people and getting to know their stories. A lot of times, and I think of myself growing up too, I felt like I gotta get out there, I gotta tell them the gospel. But we need to actually get to know them first. We need to get to know their story. What do they believe? Why do they believe it? What is their story? And then through that, it it can move into us being able to share some of our story. We need to live authentic lives so others see that it's real before they're even gonna consider thinking about it for themselves. 
Practicing hospitality is another key to this. It's a key way of witnessing. That was one, again, through this course that it really came to the forefront that hospitality, having people in our homes, sharing meals with them, these are really um, key ways that we can be witnessing. We're developing those friendships more naturally in that, that place. And we are commanded in scripture, as Christians, we are commanded to practice hospitality with our brothers and sisters in Christ and with others. And uh, there are many verses if you look that up. We also need to be ready. In 1 Peter 3, 15 and 16, it says, if someone asks about your hope as a believer, always be ready to explain it. But do this in a gentle and respectful way. Keep your conscience clear. We need to be telling our God stories, but we tell them gently, we tell them respectfully, when we're given those opportunities and we don't know when they're gonna happen, we need to be ready to do it. We need to keep an eye out for those opportunities. It's having an expectation. God, what are, you, what are you doing? Jesus said, my father's always at work. God's always at work in the lives of those around us, whether we see it or not. And when we see those places where someone's starting to ask questions, they're starting to wonder, we say, okay, God, I need to, I'm, I'm ready, what, what do I say here? How do I be a presence? And we think of Greater Moncton area here in Canada. We have an influx of immigrants coming in. People from around the world are coming to us from all backgrounds, all faiths, all religions. How can we be a light right here where we are? An author from a book um, who was talking about sharing our faith with Muslims and Jews said this, Taking people seriously as made in the image of God and engaging them humbly and honestly as our neighbors goes hand in hand with the learning process basic to interfaith witness. So it's seeing others as being made in the image of God and interacting with them humbly and honestly. We may be feeling a bit like the disciples did, looking at the borders of their land, starting to get panicky, things aren't going the way they thought they were gonna go. This mission seems big, it seems overwhelming. And here we hear the last, last words of Jesus. We are not alone, Jesus is with us. Jesus said, I am with you always. Or as the message version translates it, I'll be with you as you do this, day after day after day. Jesus is Emmanuel, God with us. He's with each of us personally when we choose to follow him, and he's with us as a church community. Jesus is the head of the body, so the church is his body, and he is the head. And he also told his disciples that he had to leave so that the Holy Spirit could come and that his presence would be with each and every one of us. The Holy Spirit is the one who empowers us. The Holy Spirit teaches us. In John 14, 26, Jesus said, but when the Father sends the advocate as my representative, that is the Holy Spirit, he will teach you everything and will remind you of everything I have told you. So we have God with us, teaching us, empowering us, reminding us. And we are on a rescue mission. Our neighbors, coworkers, fellow students, family members, they all have a deep need for God. It's not gonna be easy. Many of them have crusty, angry, bitter, hard exteriors, and they're hiding pain, disappointment, disillusionment, especially in this postmodern world where there's, there doesn't seem to be anything firm to stand on. We may face rejection, but we need to remember Jesus, who for the joy set before him endured the cross, scorning its shame, and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. We need to consider him who endured such opposition so that we will not grow weary and lose heart. And that's in Hebrews 12. And I just want to read, I want to read from Ephesians 2 to remind you, because we need to remind ourselves, why are we doing this? Why do we do this? Ephesians 2, 
Paul says this, once you were dead because of your disobedience and your many sins, you used to live in sin just like the rest of the world, obeying the devil, the commander of the powers in the unseen world. He is the spirit at work in the hearts of all those who refuse to obey God. All of us used to live that way, following the passionate desires and inclinations of our sinful nature. By our very nature, we were subject to God's anger, just like everyone else. But God is so rich in mercy, and he loved us so much that even though we were dead because of our sins, he gave us life when he raised Christ from the dead. It is only by God's grace that you have been saved. For he raised us from the dead along with Christ and seated us with him in the heavenly realms because we are united with Christ. So God can point to us in all future generations as examples of the incredible wealth of his grace and kindness toward us as shown in all he has done for us who are united with Christ Jesus. This is why we are disciples, and this is why we need to be disciples who make disciples. Remember, you're not alone. You have God's continual presence, and you have a community around you. We are in this together. So what are our next steps? How do we respond to this? Well, maybe starting at the beginning, are you a disciple of Jesus? Have you said in your heart, Jesus is Lord? Do you believe that God raised him from the dead? Do you believe these things? If you do, if you commit your life to Christ, then you're a disciple. If you're a disciple, are you keeping God's commands? Are we listening to the words of Jesus and living them out in our life? Maybe you need to go back to the YouTube channel and listen to some of the messages from this year to refresh yourself on what some of those things are or reading through the Gospels. Are you ready to keep, give an answer for why you believe? Maybe you need to sit down and write down part of your testimony, practice it in your small group, tell it to those you know. And it's not just one story of your whole life. Our story can be different aspects of our life that God has worked in, different ways that God has worked in our life that, that can relate to other people. And the other one is, where are you going? Are you going somewhere? Are you taking this, this message, this light that God has given us, and are you going somewhere with it? Are you making friends? Are you reaching out to those who are across the street, across the hall, across the different places in your life? Part of our course at the end, part of one of the assignments was that we had to write a personal mission statement. And I wanted to end with this. This is, it's not too long, but this kind of encompassed what I had learned in my course. And I'm not going to claim that I'm perfect at it. It's something that I'm aspiring to. I purpose to follow the commission of Jesus to go and make disciples. I will do this through living a life of witness to my neighbors in the places where I work, volunteer, and generally interact with others. This witness includes living a life of obedience to Christ by being a personal example of what it means to follow Jesus. It also includes extending hospitality to others, both in my home and outside my home. This witness will be through my actions as well as my words as I seek to discern God's leading in being the presence of Jesus to others. Following the Great Commission implies personal commitment as well as corporate commitment. I will be an active member of my church, seeking to encourage and build up those who are in the body of Christ so that together we may be a witness. Through our witness together, we will seek to be a blessing to those around us. I will look for ways to participate in and promote being active in our neighborhoods through social justice, generosity, and using our resources to benefit others. I will also actively pursue discipling others so that they will become active followers of Jesus. This will include leading small groups, praying with others, and providing resources so others can continue this mission. Let's pray. 
Lord, we come before you as your disciples, as your followers, and, and we hear your words to make disciples. It can feel overwhelming, it can feel scary. Remind us that you are with us, your very presence is with us. Remind us of all that Jesus has done for us and that we need to live lives of love obeying you. Remind us of your words. Remind us of your presence each and every day. Give us eyes to see the opportunities and places that, you're, that um, God our Father is at work and that you're inviting us to work with you. We ask for your grace in this, for boldness and courage, for gentleness and humility, and for love for those that you have made, for those that we are in contact with. In Jesus' name we pray these things, amen.